part four of our current series, The Invisible Return of Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us in this very important series. Um, it's definitely one of those series where I have uh, received a little bit more uh, backlash <laughs> than some of my videos. Um, I don't want to say my videos are all feel good uh, videos. They're not. I try to make sure that lots of truth is being conveyed about the Lord Jesus and his finished work for us. Uh, in this particular episode, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, before you watch this episode, make sure you watch part three, because there we deal with 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I personally believe 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 6 solve the issue, the debate between corporate body versus individual body. Now, I don't deny uh, the individual body, the resurrected individual body. Paul says it is a spiritual body. Uh, what I do deny is that we have to wait until physical death to get it. Uh, the Word of God teaches that redemption is complete, and through faith in Jesus Christ, we enter into all of the spiritual blessings. And if the spiritual body is a spiritual blessing, which we believe it is, then Paul says the following words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And in Colossians, it says you are complete in him. So what they were going through in the first century, obviously, was a transformation period. Specifically, please watch 2 Corinthians chapter 3, my episode dealing with that, which is the episode prior to this one. So the episode actually corresponds with 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, it solves the debate. And it shouldn't be a vicious debate. Okay, I don't believe it should be. Uh, do I believe is it, a, it is a serious debate? Absolutely. But it shouldn't be vicious. We should be able to discuss these things in charity and not label put labels on people like Gnostic and so forth. Now, I will confess that uh, I have been called Gnostic, which I am not. Jesus Christ is Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth. I believe that the Westminster Confession of Faith is Gnostic. It says that the body, the resurrection body, has to be raised as the, quote, self-same body. Well, that is a Gnostic position. And I do believe that the Gnostics, this is just my opinion, that the Gnostics were Jews who infiltrated the church, but it was later on. Um, I believe all the New Testament books were written before A.D. 70, and that they were not addressing Gnosticism. They were addressing the apostate Jewish priesthood. They were addressing apostate Jews, the Pharisees, who were denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. They were denying that he is high priest. And that's what 1 John is about. 1 2nd and 3rd John is about uh, the refutation of those who were denying the high priesthood, the eternal high priesthood of Jesus and his absolute deity and divinity. All right, so no, I'm not Gnostic. In fact, I would dare I say uh, the belief that we have to wait until we receive a physical body is probably closer to Gnosticism because it presupposes that the physical body is evil. Well, that's what Gnosticism teaches, that the flesh is evil. And therefore, you know, you couldn't rightly ascribe to Christ his deity when he was here incarnated uh, because he was in a body of flesh and bones. All right. The Bible from the beginning teaches that God is a spirit. Okay. Jesus established that with his own words. God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we are truly those who do worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. But this whole covenantal context of 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 6 is so vital for our understanding of what we call covenant eschatology. I believe this exalts the nature of Jesus Christ and his person and his finished work. So let's go ahead and begin with chapter four, continuing to prove that the kingdom of God is invisible. So we're going to get to the invisibility of Jesus later on in the series. But right now is, is, is the, this idea that the kingdom of God is invisible and an invisible kingdom demands an invisible king. All right, so we're going to take it up at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 18. 
and we won't make it through the whole chapter in this episode. Therefore, since we have this ministry, well, what ministry? He had just gotten done articulating the difference between the old covenant ministration or ministry of death, which was the law of Moses or the letter that kills, uh, in contrast to the New Testament ministry of life and righteousness or the glory that excelled. And we saw that. And again, go back and listen to episode three, as it is in exegesis of 2 Corinthians chapter three. So when he says, therefore, we have, since we have received this ministry, he's speaking about this new covenant ministry as per the previous chapter. As we received mercy, do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden because of shame. Not walking in trickery nor distorting the word of God, but by the open proclamation of the truth, commending ourselves to every person's conscience. Again, this is about a con contrast between old and new covenant ministration or ministries. So he says, we, to every person's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, he's not talking about a literal veil here. He is talking about veil to the heart, veil to the mind, mind and heart being the same thing. If our gospel is veiled, which he was speaking about the veil. He spoke about the two or the veil in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If our gospel now, though, is veiled, the good news, if it is veiled, which means what? You have to have spiritual understanding in order to perceive or see the gospel, see Christ. The gospel is Christ. Make no doubt about it. The Bible says this For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Well, what does Paul call Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? He says, Christ, the wisdom and power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. The gospel, the good news, Christ, it's all the same. It is Christ coming. That's what the gospel is. It is Jesus Christ. If the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Compare that with 2 Corinthians chapter 2. As those who perish were the savor of death unto God. And those who were believing or being saved, they were the savor of life. In whose case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So that they will not see the light of of the gospel or the light of Christ, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So the glory of Christ is shining. It's shining its light, but it's veiled to those who have not been given that light or revelation of Jesus. Now, God of the age, that's, uh, it's, it's debatable as to whom this God is. Uh, well, John chapter 12 clearly indicates as quoted from Isaiah, it clearly indicates that God is the one blinding the eyes. Okay, big G, the only true God. Now, the Greek word here is theos, which is the Greek word we use for God. 99% uh, of the time, that word God or theos is referring to God Almighty. It's not referring to Satan or a person. And it says God of this age. Now, again, John chapter 12 clearly says it's God Almighty that's blinding those eyes. And in Romans chapters 10 and uh, 11, it speaks of God Almighty again as the one who's blinding the eyes, all right? But we also see uh, rulers of the darkness of this age. So they're rulers, right? Now, uh, I would encourage you to compare, for instance, in the Old Testament where it says Satan, moved David to number the armies of Israel. And then in another account, it says God moved David to number the armies of Israel. Okay, so sometimes God poses as adversary. Okay, not that he's evil, but that he takes an adversarial position against certain people. All right, even David. So it's debatable as to what God of this age means. Uh, I... I could honestly go either way, probably at this point, God of this age, you know, the Bible speaks of this age and the age to come, which we are now in the age to come, the new covenant age, but there was that age. The Bible says Jesus appeared once 
in the end of the age. End of what age? The old covenant age, Hebrews chapter nine. So it can go either way. I don't want to uh, belabor that point though. But he's blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So Christ's glory, what does he say? The glory of your people Israel and a light to lighten the Gentiles. Simeon said that in Luke chapter two. This is Jesus. He lights every person that comes into the world, speaking of his people, right? Who is the image of God? He is the image. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ, right? That's the gospel, Christ. He is the gospel. He is the light. He is the presence of God. He is God Almighty. All right? That is the presence of God, His glory. It is shined upon us. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30 says that we have been glorified. Okay? Jesus said that, John 17. The glory you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one. Well, Paul says, if you are in Christ, you are all one in Christ Jesus. All right? So we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus. Now watch this. We are looking at a veiled gospel, a veiled gospel and blinded minds. These are spiritual terms. This has nothing to do with physical blindness or a physical veil. So we're dealing in spiritual categories here. We're also looking at the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Again, it is not a physical glory. It is a spiritual glory. It is an eternal glory as opposed to the old covenant fading glory. This is a new covenant glory that excels. Again, watch the episode. Watch the last episode. So the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we're going to look at all four of those. Uh, Blinded minds and veiled gospel go hand in hand. So we'll put those two together. Veiled gospel. Let's take take it up with Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 16. Now watch this. Watch this. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, this is not something that we can conjure up. This is not something we can learn through intellectual gain or human smarts, okay, or the wisdom of this age, which was that Old Testament age, 1 Corinthians 1. Scribes, those wise ones or lawyers of that age. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous. So he's saying, he, 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 if you want to talk about a blinded person, he was as blind as they could be. Zealous of the traditions of my ancestors, but when God, so now he ascribes all glory to God for revelation. In other words, you cannot see, you cannot believe in Jesus Christ unless the revelation has been given, is what he's saying. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born, hallelujah, Ephesians 1, and called me through his grace, was pleased to what? Reveal his son in me the invisible Christ, right? I mean, this, is, this testifies of it uh, as solidly as anything else we will study, but right now we're looking at the invisibility of the kingdom of God. When it uh, pleased God to reveal his son in me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being. And then go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age, old covenant age, or of the rulers of this age. So there you have uh, rulers of God, uh, rulers of this age. And so that's an argument that the God of this age of 2 Corinthians 4 could definitely be referring to the rulers of that age or a ruler of that age. Could be referring to the high priesthood, the high priest, the priesthood. But it says they are doomed to perish. So he's speaking about the blindness. This is all about spiritual things. They are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom. Secret and hidden. Who is that wisdom? That's Christ. Secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. So they are glorified now. 
Okay, it was hidden. No one was glorified under the Old Testament. They are now glorified through Christ in them. That's what it means to have Christ dwelling in them. None of the rulers of this age, there it is again, understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Right? You don't hate Jesus if God has chosen to reveal himself to you. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. He's quoting from Isaiah, which says, for those who, I believe it's chapter 62, those who wait for him, waiting in love are the same thing. Faith in God, faith in Christ, love for Christ, waiting for Christ. That was, they're one and the same. These things God has revealed to us. So in other words, you don't have to wait until you die to have your eyes see, your ears hear, and to have your heart perceive those things which God had prepared in the old covenant. Well, now he says, God has revealed them to us. How? Through the spirit. It's an invisible kingdom. It's an invisible revelation. For the spirit searches everything. This has nothing to do with physical death. This has to do with God's spiritual revelation under the new covenant and the ministry of the spirit. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit? That is within. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God. So that world, he's talking about that world of self-righteousness and Moses. All right, we have not received that spirit of works righteousness through the law of Moses, but the spirit that is from God so that we may be able to, we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. It's a gift to have Christ revealed as a gift, to have this New Testament mindset, this revelation of Jesus, this spiritual life, this born again status that comes from God Almighty. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit. Now, so many people, uh, particularly within the Calvinist camp, now I'm sovereign grace, but the Calvinist camp, they like to take this and say, well, they were spiritual in the Old Testament that this actually exists. No, it did not. This is a New Testament reality. Look at the whole context. He said all these spiritual things were hidden before from those people under the old covenant. Jesus even said, many wise men and prophets have desired to see the things which you have seen, but they did not see it. So this, this has to do with new covenant versus old covenant. This is a new covenant revelation specifically consigned to this everlasting new covenant period. So, those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit. But now that we're in this new covenant age, what he's saying is all those who are true believers now have that revealed to them. You could be a true believer in the Old Testament, and that faith definitely was given by God, but it didn't grant the spiritual revelation because Christ had not risen from the dead yet. He had to conquer death first. So all those physical resurrections, no, that had nothing to do with the eternal spiritual revelation in Christ Jesus. Those who are unspiritual, that's why Hebrews says, women receive their life, uh, their dead raised to life again, but they were convinced that there was a better resurrection. So there's something better than that Old Testament physical revela- uh, physical resurrections, all, them, all of those physical re- resurrections. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's spirit. Okay, for they are foolishness to them and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual, that is given the revelation of God to understand Jesus and his fulfillment of all the promises of all those promises made to the fathers. Those who are spiritual discern all things, that is new covenant things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why? Because we have Christ. 
We've been given the mind of Christ, the revelation of all of those spiritual realities in Christ Jesus. Jesus is said in Acts chapter 13 to have fulfilled all of the promises made to the fathers through his resurrection. And that life began at the outpouring of the spirit. And then Jesus again would be dwelling in their hearts by the time he would show the outward destruction of the physical temple. So anyway, just rest assured, 2 Corinthians 4 is dealing with that same context, and we will continue our exegesis of 2 Corinthians 4 in episode 5. So God bless you so much. Please don't forget to support us at patreon.com forward slash NCMI Live, and also please subscribe to the YouTube channel NCMI Live. Please subscribe in it, and it will give you a notice uh, when any of these videos is up- uploaded. God bless you.